Um, so Alex is the editor of the International Socialist Journal. He's also the author of a number of publications which are available from bookmarks, including Imperialism and Global Political Economy. Um, so those books will be available afterwards or in bookmarks. So without further ado, Alex. Thanks a lot. That's very kind. Um, a, a year ago, um, I think it was still possible to harbour the illusion that Trump, nasty though he un undeniably is as a, an individual, just represented in terms of the evolution of American capitalism and uh, capitalism more generally, was just a bit of froth. That he had a cabinet packed full of rich people, of bankers, and so on and so forth. The head of, uh, former head of Exxon, the giant oil company. Um, and uh, he was going to pursue basically right-wing Republican policies, tax cuts for the rich, deregulation, but nothing that was going to represent a serious disruption of the uh, existing uh, capitalist, capitalist order. That's what it was possible still to argue a year ago. It seems to me now that it's completely impossible to argue that, that now. The, the key kind of, if you like, representatives of, of um, American capital in his cabinet, cabinet have gone. They were either sacked or, res or, or resigned. Trump is now pursuing the first serious trade wars mounted by a major capitalist power since, since the 1930s. And he's carrying them out against the two other major centers of global capitalism. In other words, the European Union and China. So this is, a, you know, for all of us, I mean, unless there's someone who was born in 1930 in the room, you know, it's always possible, um, that un unless there's someone who dates back to the 1930s around, this is new stuff, this scale of trade conflict among leading, leading cap capitalist powers. But that, of course, isn't the end to, this, end to the story. Um, one of the things that just has happened in the last few weeks in the context of the, um, the, 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 the Trump's essential de declaration of trade war, which was on the 1st of March, is a concerted attempt to polarize politics in the West on the basis of anti-migrant racism. And we see this very clearly with his attacks on Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, who is now caught in a vice between Trump on the one hand and the, uh, the rising far-right, racist right in Europe, including in Germany itself, but more powerful in other countries like Italy, Austria, and so, so on and so forth. Trump, Trump is doing this. You know, he he's sent tweets attacking the German government. Now, we know Trump tweets about everything, but on the whole, it's unusual for the President of the United States to be attacking the Chancellor of Germany by, by tweet. But again, although it's a bizarre form, all this st stuff with tweets, it's, there's something, something much bigger going on here. And it, when it comes to foreign policy, his biggest initiative has been to give a get out of jail card to Kim Jong Il, the uh, sorry, Kim Jong Un. Jing, Kim Jong Il was Kim Jong Un's dad, um, also ruler of North North Korea, um, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Um, uh, you know, Kim Jong Un is not at all a stupid guy. He's desperate to end his country's economic isolation. Trump has given it to him, and he, you know, he's grabbed it uh, in exchange for really quite superficial concessions when it comes to, comes to North Korea's nuclear weapons program. At the same time as making life easy for the North Korean regime, which was the real you know, outsider, the, real, the most exiled power in, or state, state in the world till, till very recently, Trump seems to be at least playing with the idea of a war with, with Iran, which, given everything that's happening in the Middle East, is something that could have the most uh, enormous and destructive consequences. Okay, 
So how, how, do, how are we to understand this? I mean, is it just, you know, there's a liberal narrative, which is, you know, sorry, I don't control the mic. So if someone, can you hear me now? Yeah, can you hear me? I can always shout, I'm very happy to shout. Um, okay, so the question is, is he just a crazy guy who, through bad luck, has become president of the United States? This is the liberal narrative. This horrible guy cheated. All the Russians cheated for him. Uh, and that's why things are going so badly wrong. I mean, please, how do these people think their great hero, John F. Kennedy, became president of the United States? He became president through ballot stuffing in the state of Illinois, which tipped the Electoral College his way. No one goes on about that when they talk about, about Kennedy, but that's what happened, or that's what most people think, who know about uh, the 1960 presidential thing, what happened. So please, don't give us this babyish stuff about the Russians and so, so on and so forth. Um, what we have to do is to try and understand what the logic is at work here. Yeah. And there is a logic at work, despite the, the craziness and vanity of Trump. The, the deepest logic is, is to do with um, what produced Trump's success in, in 2016. And the answer to that is the global economic and financial crisis that broke out in 2007 and 8, just about um, 10 years ago. Now, until 2016, the global elite, you know, meet at places like Davos, would sit around and say, God, we did well. God, we did well out of the crisis. Okay, it's true, it's a really big crisis and growth is much slower than it was, was before. And it's also true that the crisis has accelerated China's rise relative to the US and therefore, if we're looking at it in relative terms, the decline of the US as the dominant capitalist economy. But compared to what could have happened, we got off very nicely. We saved the banks and therefore restabilized the system. Uh, the central banks in turn have poured money into the financial system through quantitative easing, which has meant that rich people can buy even more assets than they already had. So they're doing, they're doing fine. Um, and they haven't had to make significant economic or political c concessions so that Neoliberalism survived the great crisis of 2000, 2000, 2007 and 8. And best of all, the ruling classes were able to displace the costs of the crisis onto ordinary people through policies like austerity. So what a great success story for the existing, existing neoliberal order. So like a bunch of crooks, which of course, is, sorry, like a bunch of crooks, as a bunch of crooks, they could sit together and congratulate themselves on how well they done. Only you should always wait for the other shoe to fall. And the other shoe fell in 20, 2016, or started to fall in, in 2016. Because what we've seen is neoliberalism, sorry, capitalism is still unfortunately very much going. Neoliberalism is still institutionally dominant. It, neoliberalism guides the policies of the major capitalist powers. And unfortunately, there isn't continuous rioting in the streets or mass strikes. So in that sense, the insisting system is car carrying on. Politically, however, it has imploded. Politically, it is now subject to massive challenges for an extreme right, a racist right, at its fringes and t sometimes more than its fringes, a fascist right, which is exploiting everything that the ruling classes did to save themselves from the crisis at the expense of ordinary people in order to challenge the existing order and to take power. So we've, we've had the Brexit referendum. Not important to emphasize there, not just to do with the right or racism and so on, but nev nevertheless definitely a rebellion, a slap in the flames, face at the cosmopolitan neoliberal elite that have been dominant in Britain since, uh, since, the, since Thatcher pushed through neoliberalism in the 19, 1980s, continued, of course, by New Labour. We've had Trump's election, 
We've had the German elections last September, where a far-right racist party came third in the elections and has pulled the whole of German politics to the, to the, to the right. We have the, had the elections in Austria and Italy. In Austria, we now have a right-wing government pursuing openly racist anti-migrant policies with a fascist party as a coalition partner in that government. And we've had the Italian elections. Anyone who went to the meeting about Italy before, before the break will have heard about how, again, a hard racist government is now in, in power in, in Italy. And the, the, therefore, we have to see Trump as part, as part of an international phenomenon that represents right-wing parties who, let's put it like this, they're not necessarily anti-neoliberal, but they're not wedded to neoliberalism, are exploiting the backlash to the crisis to try and drag society to the, to the, to the, to the, to the right. And the way in which Merkel found herself squeezed between, um, on the one hand, Trump attacking her, and on the other hand, Salvini, the leader of the Liga in Italy, the dominant figure in the Italian government who's been making the, the running around anti-migrant policies, is, is spectacular. So now the EU has um, agreed to, to create what they call disembarkation platforms. Um, it would be more honest to say concentration camps for refugees on the borders of the EU in very nice places like Libya, but Merkel, because the most right-wing party in her coalition government are terrified of losing more, more votes and seats to, the, to the, ra the hard racist party, the AFD, and the state elections in Bavaria that come up later this year, she's now agreed to have uh, detention centers on Germany's borders. The Austrian government uh, has reacted by saying, we'll block our borders with Germany to stop you uh, dumping refugees back on us. I mean, the language is horrible because of the way in which refugees are treated like things to be moved, moved around and, and so on. So what we see is the beginnings of a generalization of these, the kind of right-wing politics that triumphed with Trump in the presidential elections in, in November um, 2016, and that polarizing politics quite generally in North America and Europe. That's the states of the thing. So when this bastard comes to, to Britain, even though he's tiptoeing around London, uh, late, late, uh, whenever it is, uh, next, next week, you know, this is what he represents. Now, what, what does Trump represent? So, so th this is, what we're seeing is the unraveling of the political consequences of the crisis, in which unfortunately it's not the left that is really benefiting from the crisis, it's the racist right. That's, that's essentially what's, what's going on there. But Trump is also president of the United States. That means his job is to run American capitalism or to run the political side of American capitalism. So what sort of strategy do, does he represent there? Now, he's a very, very incoherent guy, as is obvious, you know. He, stumbles from one impression to another. But when it comes to economics, he's quite consistent. His line is that the US has been um, ripped off and exploited crucially by its allies over the last 30, 40 years. His list includes Saudi Arabia, Japan, West, uh, uh, G Germany, of course, more recently, He's added China, who has a much more ambiguous relationship to the US. But all these countries have ripped the US off economically. This is why ordinary working class Americans have suffered so, so much. And the solution is America first. And America first isn't just a nasty slogan. America first means the adoption of protectionist policies. And this is what the announcement of the trade wars. It also involves it's worth adding because Trump is going to a NATO summit next week and they're terrified what he's going to say there. No one knows what he's going to say there, including the rest of the American government, because he also thinks that NATO is a device through which the US has been ripped off, that the Germans 
you know, sell all these cars to the US, but they free ride on US military pro protection via NATO, which, to be honest, is true. Uh, he's not wrong about that. Now, this, and he's now, and what seemed like talk in the presidential campaign is now becoming reality. The tariffs are being applied, and they're not just being applied by the US. The Chinese are now imposing their counter-tariffs because the Chinese government are serious about rebuilding China as, at the very least, probably that's their main aim, the dominant power in the Asia-Pacific region. And therefore, they're not going to be pushed around by Trump. So, you know, there's now a real, a real clash, clash taking place. But this produces enormous contradictions for American capitalism, because what people like Trump and his former advisor, Steve Bannon, denounce as the rule-based international liberal order, didn't just appear in the sky one day. Um, it was patiently and protractedly constructed by the United States itself. NATO, the world, the, now the WTO, the other Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, all that was constructed by the United States to create a set of institutions that would produce an environment that would allow American capitalism, American transnational corporations and banks to flourish. And on the whole, it's worked out well for them. Let's distinguish, I mean, it, it may, it's important to make two qualifications. It hasn't stopped US relative decline and it, um, and it's produced all sorts of bad consequences for ordinary working class Americans. For example, in the Rust Belt, the Midwest, where um, the decline of traditional industries has been so concentrated. So it's not been an unvarnished uh, good for the US. But nevertheless, it has worked out very well for American capitalism. And the transnational corporations centered on the United States have been able to develop global supply chains through which, in particular, they're able to exploit much cheaper labor um, in um, um, different parts of the global south, particularly East and South Asia, to produce their commodities as efficiently as possible. As it, uh, Apple is a classic example of this, and we see something similar within the European Union. I mean, Britain is caught in these global supply chains. Uh, which are tied up with its membership of the EU, which is why they're having such a dif difficult time in checkers today. At least I hope they are. Um, so um, so it, lots of ordinary working class Americans have suffered as a resu re result, if you like, of the liberal international order. But it hasn't, the beneficiary hasn't just been Germany or China, whatever the, those names mean. Uh, the beneficiaries, crucially, have been the core sections of American, American capital. So what we have is something classic that we saw again in the 1930s, a displacement of what is really a class antagonism, American workers getting screwed by American bosses into racial and national, national com conflicts. And this takes its most concentrated form in the racist targeting of migrants, where we have, if you like, Trump and Salvini competing to see who can be the, 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 nasty, the nastiest. Now, important qualification to make. Of course, there are sections of American capitalism that will benefit from the protectionism. The smaller, less productive, less profitable industrial firms. Quite a lot of them are saying, we like what Trump is, is, is doing. And it's also important to understand that the world economy won't disintegrate if, with a higher level of protection. Even Paul Krugman, a leading liberal economist, has shown that the most probable uh, um, uh, consequence of a trade war is uh, a greater concentration of, national, of production in individual national economies, and therefore at least the partial dismantling of these global supply chains but he reckons that US GDP would fall, I can't remember, by two or three percentage points. I mean, that can mean 
a lot of jobs and so on and so forth, but it's not like economic catastrophe, which is important to say because there are some liberals and social democrats who say, if there's protectionism, we're back in the 1930s. Not as uh, we're, we're faced with the kind of economic collapse that we saw in the 1930s. That's not necessarily uh, uh, the most probable outcome. Um, in other words, American capitalism could live with Trump's trade wars. It could adapt to Trump's trade wars, and no doubt some would, would bene benefit uh, fr from them. It's also important to say that there's more support in the core elements of American capital for, having, for um, denying China access to US uh, technology or to technology that's uh, produced in the US and other parts of the Western capitalist bloc. There's a lot of resentment that Chinese foreign investment and also Chinese o China's own policies for attracting investment in China have uh, led to lots of what shall I say, pinching of copyright, uh, lots of shift of intellectual property to China, to China and so on. So there's more support within the American ruling class for getting tough on China about technology. So they could, uh, they could adapt. Nevertheless, these policies are not in the interests of the core of American capitalism. So what we see here with Trump, and we also see this with Brexit, is the tail wagging the dog. In other words, the political and ideological superstructure has got out of sync with the economic base. Marx always said that there's an interaction between base and superstructure, that the superstructure can react back on the, the base. It's, a, it's reacting back on the base big time. The underlying cause is economic. As I said, it's to do with the, the crisis and so, so on and so forth. But the political institutions, certainly of American capitalism, are increasingly out of sync with its, um, its, its class base um, in the American banks and, and, and corporations. This is an indication of a period of more profound instability than we've seen in the past. Um, this is further worrying because, you know, when you have instability, if you get unpopular, the way out, there's a traditional way out, which is military adventures. Trump was elected denouncing the military adventures of George W. Bush and so on and so forth, but he's actually supported quite a lot of US military activity in the Middle East. He's done this, probably what is a vanity deal with Kim Jong-un in North, North Korea, which clearly a lot of the American ruling class are un unhappy with. Um, but more serious is the focus on Iran. Part of the turnover in his administration, in his cabinet a couple of months ago, was the appointment of John Bolton as national security advisor. John Bolton's line is, um, I don't think the US should generally go around overthrowing governments it doesn't like. But there's a very important exception, Iran. It would be very good to achieve uh, regime change in, in Iran. This is a, I think it's a crazy program. Whatever you say about the Islamic Republican regime in Iran, it has shown itself to be a very formidable force and to take it on is, is a big deal. But nevertheless, this is uh, what, uh, what Bolton advocates. And you can imagine a scenario in which, uh, and the, uh, Trump is close to two governments in the region who are eager to take on Iran. On the one hand, the Saudi regime, which, for which uh, the Iranian regime, because it's the center, the political center of Shia, Shia is Islam, and um, the Saudi regime legitimizes itself as the keepers of Sunni or orthodoxy. The Saudi regime are very eager to, to weaken and damage the Iranian regime. And then Israel which sees uh, Iran as the most serious threat to Israel's regional interests. This is justified. George Bush was an idiot. He didn't think, what happens if you remove Saddam Hussein? If you overthrow Saddam Hussein, the leader of this powerful, traditionally powerful state in the Arab world, I Iraq, who gets stronger? Simple answer, Iran. And everything that has happened in the Middle East since the fall of Saddam Hussein has confirm that logic. Iran is now much stronger than it, than it was. So the Saudis and Israelis 
and Bolton aren't completely crazy when they're saying a regime that we don't like is getting stronger. But the, to risk a war with Iran could have huge consequences. Actually, there was a very interesting article in the US Journal of Foreign Policy a few days ago, which said that Mattis, James Mattis, who's the general, he's really the last general standing, almost, in Trump's administration. He appointed lots of generals, most of them to make himself look respectable. Most of them have gone. But Mattis is still there as defense secretary, and he sees himself as a guardian of the US global empire, which he's worried that Trump is destabilizing. And he's um, opposing what Bolton wants to do. But this article says his influence is weakening. The most interesting thing in the article is, though, that it says that one reason why Mattis is opposing um, this, um, the idea of war with Iran is because the American armed forces are getting weaker. They spent the last year, 20 years waging protracted war in the Middle East, uh, and there's erosion of both personnel and equipment. So the Air Force, the Marines, the Army, um, there's another service, but I've forgotten what it is now. Um, the Navy, yes, how could I forget the Navy? They're all getting weaker and less efficient. So, okay, we could w win the, what this article says is we could win the first round of a war with Iran, uh, but after that it would get difficult. Strange, really, that's always ha what happens with America's wars. If people are stupid to concentrate their forces in an open space, the Americans will wipe them out. Once that phase is over and people take to the hills or the roadsides, then it always gets much more, more, more um, d d difficult. And, but of course, what, how Trump would react to failure, the prospect of failure in Iran is also slightly, slightly alarming. So there's a set of dangers there that we need to address and is one reason why it's necessary to continue to build an international anti-war anti movement. But the example of the erosion of the American armed forces illustrates that Trump is a product not just of the crisis, but of US decline. You know, what makes him credible is the idea of, to, the, to the section of the American population who voted for him and who still supports him, according to the opinion polls. What makes him credible is the sense that the US is declining, that it's losing out compared to other powers, that its industries are disintegrating and so on. Now, this doesn't accurately fit the picture of US capitalism, but it's certainly true that the power of the US state relative to other powers in the world is in decline. It is becoming more difficult to manage this, this order. And the idea that, the, that the, the simple assertion of military power can begin to reverse this situation is clearly something that from t time to time is in Trump's mind. Like, you know, when he tweets about he's got more missiles than Kim Jong-un. I mean, when you look at the size of the North Korean economy, it's not really surprising. It's not a great achievement to have more missiles than North Korea. So this is an underlining of the, um, the dangers of the, the situation. But if we step back from those dangers, what we have to say is that what Trump represents, which isn't just himself, but the growth of a, growth of a hard anti-racist right, not, oh, sorry, anti-racist right, Contradiction in terms of hard racist right, not necessarily fascist right, although there are important fascist elements within this right, the growth uh, of a hard anti-racist right that is now in positions of political power in key citadels of Western capitalism, above all the United States itself, is a product of this prolonged period of crisis and US decline, relative decline. And this period will go on. There's no sign of any real fundamental turnaround of Ameri American capitalism. The figures don't support that idea. There's a bit of froth at the minute, um, but the froth doesn't represent any deep change in the plight of capitalism, particularly in the, in the, in the West. And what we can say is that the, the difficulties that capitalism face give rise to increasing irrationality. The pursuit of solutions like the protectionist one that aren't real solutions. And Trump is a good example of that ir irrationality. Now, of course, all this represents a dreadful threat to ordinary people in their lives. How is it to be resisted? 
The one thing not to do is to pursue a liberal solution. In other words, essentially to defend, and this is what some people on the left argue, to defend the existing institutions and policies of Western liberal capitalism against the, th the threat from the, the right. Because if you want to, you know, all the stuff about Trump and Hillary Clinton and so on, Hillary Clinton, what, you know, if Hillary Clinton, you know, the, in the strange, you know, where it's bizarrely to happen that Hillary Clinton uh, asked me, why did Trump win? I'd say, because of you. <laughs> this isn't going to happen. Anyway, but it's essentially the established, what Tariq Ali calls the, the extreme center, the mainstream neoliberal, neoliberals who are very much in power in the European Union, for example, they produce this backlash. So to try to align with them would be a disaster. What we have to do instead is to try and build the broadest... Yep, yep. Oh, I, I'm about to finish. Um, the famous last words. The broadest possible anti-racist movement that can challenge these people on the streets. And let's not think... You know, I mean, the Football Lads Alliance, the Democratic Football Alliance, they look like the most sort of stupid parochial kind of phenomenon. Don't kid yourself. Tommy Robinson, I mean, it's bizarre, but Tommy Robinson is a world figure. He's a world hero for the alt-right. That's why people like her builders came to speak in his support at the demonstration a few, a few weeks ago. What has given these bastards confidence and a sense of power is the advances of Trump and the rest of the racist right in, in, in Europe. So we confront this thing here, not just in the form of Trump visiting or something like that. We confront it on our streets. And we will confront it more and more unless we're able to build as big and strong a racist, anti-racist movement as possible that can begin to swamp these bastards on the streets. That's essential. That's number one. But secondly, all this mess is a product of capitalism and the way in which the capitalists didn't, they didn't get out of their crisis, but they avo avoided the worst consequences of their crisis after the crash in 2007 and 8. We are, one way in which we pay for that crisis is in the rise of the racist, racist right. This makes it essential to build on as large a scale as possible a revolutionary socially alternative alternative that can begin to mobilize people against the system itself. I think the situation is uh, very fa incredibly fast moving. I don't know about anyone else, but sometimes I find myself really having to pause for breath. Um, take the example of the agreement in Germany. Um, just in the last couple of days to put internment camps on the German-Austrian border and turn back refugees. Part of reinforcing a chain reaction across Europe with fences and walls right back and camps right back to source in uh, North Africa and beyond. All the while, while deterrence by drowning in the Mediterranean uh, 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 claims ever more thousands of lives. This is mirrored, I think, by a political chain reaction into the heart of the system with the growth of the far right and fascist organizations. And this is rooted in a global crisis, which includes military rivalry. And I want to make a point about this because. I don't know if people remember, but when Trump was first elected, there was an argument in mainstream journals and newspapers, including on the left, that actually, peculiarly, perhaps Trump was an isolationist who would draw back from military intervention in the Middle East and so forth. Well, where is that kind of naivety now? And I think we should remember the character of the far right and the fascists in 1930s. Three aspects to highlight. 
One, their utter racism and violence aimed at minorities. Secondly, uh, and in tandem, the smashing of working class organization. But thirdly, military rivalry. Because essentially what those fascist organizations and parties did was to t look at, use the existing military rivalries, turn to the ruling classes and say, we can prosecute these to success and with determination and violence that, that you can't. And these are the threats that in the longer term we face on the back of the rise of the far right and fascists. And therefore the crucial first step on the 13th and 14th is focused on their Islamophobia, on their racism and so forth. But in the longer term, if we don't stop them here, if we don't stop them now, we face these other threats that are in the wings just as they were in the past history. After Judith, the next speaker will be Lawrence Wong. I think it's really important um, to keep in mind where Alex started is the idea of we underestimate Trump at our peril. And I mean, we're, you know, you're constantly, there's some new column in The Guardian today from some liberal commentator talking about he's just a fool, he just does the first thing that comes into his head, which I'm sure is true. But the fact he didn't get to be president by being a complete fool, by being something that we should underestimate, and the idea that he's got no ideology and there's no method in the madness. And I think we have to watch that, you know, um, as Alex said, the whole idea that the Democrats are still fantasizing about, oh my goodness, what happened about Hillary, and not realizing that what he was able to tap into you know, was actually that popular sense of, you know, we used to make things, we used to make cars, we used to, you know, mine for coal, we used to be a great American dominant, um, you know, global power, which they still are the biggest. But that sense of, again, you get some people to say, well, he's not a populist because he's not actually doing things for the popular, for people generally. Well, you don't, right-wing populists aren't there to deliver for people, they're there to tap into, you know, popular sense of um, being done, hard done by, whether it's by migrants, whether it's by the EU, you know, Trump says the EU has been robbing us, it wants to get into our piggyback, you know, that sense of everybody else is against us, America, and we're, I'm going to deliver for you, I'm going to make sure we build cars in Detroit, or we're going to, you know, dig mines in Maryland or whatever, and I think that sense of the contradiction is always there, you know, that actually he can tap into and express these things, but actually doesn't, isn't delivering for those things at all, and obviously, at the moment, still delivering for the rich and the ruling class, but even there, you know, the, the whole thing about tariffs, as Alex pointed to, is creating arguments about, you know, with the very car manufacturers he said he was going to, you know, help them build lots of jobs in America. The tariffs, are, in that sense, bits of the ruling class falling out as well. And I think this just gives us this sense of instability, not just that he's obviously an unstable individual, but linked in with the whole global instability we face and what that he's just throwing these, you know, completely unpredictable things into the world. People would have known what Hillary Clinton was. You know, she was a hawk, you know. People would have predicted what she was going to do, but they can't sit there and predict exactly what Trump is going to do, and that's what makes him so dangerous. But I suppose I just wanted to end by saying we've also got to look at what he's provoked in, in terms of dissent from below. You know, it's there, isn't it? You know, not only did you see when he first got um, uh, inaugurated, you know, the magnificent women's marches and then repeated again at the beginning of this year, but those demonstrations about both the splitting of the families, but again, when he originally brought in the anti-Muslim law, were absolutely fantastic and something that shows that there's also a sense, you know, of tension that actually, you know, that there's people fighting and actually realizing that there's a potential for to, to actually challenge him. Because I don't think it's enough to sit back as some of the Democrats do in America say, oh, the links with Russia, we can call him a traitor and that will bring him down. And they think, oh, this will bring him down or this will do, you know, okay, one of them might do, but actually in the long run, the thing about somebody with his politics, he can turn around and go, look, it's the fake news. Look, it's the elites. They've stopped me doing what I wanted to do. I was going to do this for you, but they stopped me. So he's always got that get out. It may not always work for him, but that sense of actually, therefore, it needs actual struggle. It needs an actual fight. And not only here, because I think if we have a big balloon of him as a baby in the sky and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands in the streets, that will go around the world as well. And he doesn't like being seen as somebody that people can challenge. Lawrence will be followed by Paul Jenkins. I'm a trained teacher from England, so I have to test you. Which Financial Times journalist recently wrote that 
the demands by Trump upon China is he likened it to the unequal treaties. That response from Martin Wolf actually was saying that we could all understand that retaliatory tariffs imposed by China is something reasonable for any nation state. I would like to ask a question here, and my opinion is that China should not impose any retaliatory tariffs because the tariffs imposed by China, firstly, will hurt its own people most, and secondly, um, the majority of people around the rest of the world, you know, they are our friends. So, you know, it's a character of a government that it says how it responds. Now, there's also a second question. Now, so far, I would characterize China's rise as late Chinese development, late Chinese capitalism, walking in the footsteps of early Western capitalism. Second thing to say, however, is that Chinese capitalism has developed massively outside the umbrella of American capitalism. So far, you haven't heard anything nasty, but there has been a lot of it. Really, it centers around the state. It's completely illiberal. All kinds of wrong things are happening. And I can understand that when some people look for alternatives, people turn around to say, you know, the state, maybe state investment is good. That people look for an alternative and say that, you know, the existence of the state is something positive. My argument would be that the behavior of the state China is strange in the sense that its per capita income is $8,000 per, per person. You know, in America, I think it's $30,000. Yet it's the second largest um, um, power in, in, in the world in terms of how much money it has. So consequently, there are a couple of things you see. People talk about, you know, you might know about this, there is behavior in Africa. My argument is that China should not be investing in Africa. 700 million workers, sorry, 700 million Chinese have become workers and have had their wages rise from one dollar to 150. I'll come back to that in a minute. But actually, there's still another 500 million who need development, who need so on and so forth. Then finally, I just want to say one thing. Sometimes our, our picture, which will come from the liberal um, um, media, will be there is no civil society, everything is terrible, the state is all oppressive. There is no Facebook. Actually, I just want to say two things, you see. I, I'm not sure if it's completely true. One thing to say is that there have been quite a few struggles in China, but the most important thing to say is that they have been winning. I went to a meeting of um, Hong Kong socialists and, you know, war on one, and they came and they said, that, you know, there were strikes for pensions. These women, they struck. They wanted 100% of the pensions, but they only got 50%. It was terrible. I just think, my goodness, you know, from here we have experienced, you know, um, what is it, 10, 12 years of austerity. So I would say that in the 1950s and the 1960s, someone said that you've never had it so good. But then in the 1960s and 1970s, we had the highest level of class struggle. So just one thing about the vibrancy of civil society in China. I don't know if it's true or not. But two national strikes have been called, not by, a, not by a union, but really through social media. A national crane operator strike and a national truck driver strike. Now, apparently, this was reported by an anti-communist um, um, website, right? And he said, and they said that, you know, did, why did it happen on the day? I don't know if it's true because it involves a huge amount of coordination if it's true. He said, this is adopting an old military strategy from China. Faint in the East, strike in the West. In other words, we call for the strike on the 1st of May, but actually workers would actually go on strike on the 30th of April. So I don't know if that's true. So I'm saying that there's a huge amount of struggle. They are winning, small, but that does not make China socialist in any way. So to understand it, right. it is capitalism following in the steps of Western capitalism. Just before Paul speaks, um, there's a question from Mike, which is, is a real war the way out of the crisis for the capitalists? Okay. Uh, there's no doubt that, as Alex has said, Trump has given confidence to the fascists and the far right uh, on the streets. And we know, don't we, that Trump, for instance, uh, tweeted out tweets from Britain First last year we know that uh, we saw the events in Charlottesville on the streets of the US last year when a young woman, an anti-fascist, was killed and Trump, of course, uh, failed to, uh, to, say the, to say the least, Trump failed to condemn the fascists. And, of course, when 15,000 
fascists and far-right demonstrators come out on the streets of London on 9th of June? Who was one of the people that sent uh, a message in support of Tommy Robinson? It was Steve Bannon, whose people will know is the former aide to Donald Trump himself. Um, as did, by the way, the FN, the Front National from France. Alex mentioned as well how Gert Wilders spoke on that demonstration. Uh, Gerard Batten, the leader of UKIP, spoke on that demonstration in support of Tommy Robinson. And there's a worrying trend here, really, which is, as we're seeing across Europe, you're seeing the linking up of a far-right electoralism with a fascist stroke far-right street fighting movement at one and the same time. And there's a danger, therefore, that the mainstream of politics are welcoming the actual fascists into office. Again, this is a pattern we see across Europe. You know, Italy, Germany, Austria, and you know, when you, when you mention those countries, you know, it's a list, isn't it, of it's striking that these are countries that experience fascism and experience the Holocaust uh, in, in recent history. And as we've seen the far right linking up internationally and across Europe, we've got to do the same. So Stand Up to Racism have called an international anti-racist conference on the 20th of October in London, and I'm asking everyone in this room to book up for that at the Stand Up to Racism stall this weekend. But also, absolutely, the demonstrations on the 13th to the 14th are absolutely vital. We need to get as many people out as possible to protest against Trump on the 13th of July and to protest against those supporting Tommy Robinson on the 14th of July. All roads lead to the 13th and the 14th. It's absolutely vital that not only you get there, but you bring as many people as possible to those demos as well. The next speaker will be Charlie Kimber, and Charlie will be followed by Kyle from Dundee. Uh, Trump has inspired reaction everywhere, and one of the clearest examples of that is Israel-Palestine. Um, Surely one of the iconic images is of Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner meeting with Netanyahu in mid-May for the opening of moving of the US Embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, on the same day that 58 Palestinians were shot down on the Gaza border. Uh, this is not some carefully constructed plan to try and produce a fake, but nonetheless an attempt to have some sort of peace process. Uh, instead, Trump has lined up with the Israeli state and by so doing has inspired them to still greater crimes. And this is a process uh, which it seems to me is likely to continue because it emboldens the Israeli state against the Iranians. And Alex quite rightly said that the clearest threat of wider war at the moment is precisely that against Iran by Saudi Arabia and Israel with the Americans backing. And I think we have to recognize that is a real threat. It is a not simply some abstract process that's going on. There are forces pushing towards it and Trump is assisting in those process and we have to understand just the scale of the challenge and the urgency therefore in front of us and I think there is a process of polarizing going on you can see it in America but the polarizing at the moment is stronger on the right than it is on the left we have to face reality about that it is there on the left the demonstrations over the caging of children uh, are real and they're important if you look at the strike figures in America, it's quite interesting. By the beginning of May, there had been more strikes in America than in the whole of the year before. So in four months, we have as many strike days as the whole of the year before. Why? Largely because of a wave of teachers' strikes, where teachers drew inspiration from the struggle that took place in, inspiration, in, in West Virginia, and then had a number of other strikes rolling out from that. But tell the truth about it, the effect of the caging of children on, on Trump's poll rating was it went up. It went up. In other words, he hardened up a group of people at the center uh, of his support base who he then said, 
I am standing up again. When I said that I was going to go for migrants, I meant it. And this is a message that he rolls out everywhere. This is not a council of despair. But it is a council to say, look reality in the face. And to say that when we talk about the necessity for broadly based anti-racist movements, it's because the situation is urgent. It cannot be postponed until the level of workers' activity changes people's consciousness and unifies people enough to be able to extinguish the racist message. We have to organise against the racists now. Kyle will be followed by Denis Goddard. There's a few things I want to mention. Um, number one is focusing on America, number two is more closer to home. I honestly think, and I said at the time, if Bernie Sanders won the Democratic nomination, I think he would have won against that bastard, and I do believe that. Someone else that I wish happened after he, after he did lose it, and Hillary lost the vote, because, let's face it, she is she's not much better than Trump at all. Um, and I, I said last year at the time, I was kind of glad in a little way that Trump won, because I thought it might make the working class more angry that a complete racist misogynist got voted in and people might actually take to the streets, whereas if Hillary got voted in, nothing much would have changed at all. Um, one of the other things that I wish happened is I wish Sanders started his own party after what happened when Trump got elected and made a new party, a left-wing party. I mean, let's be honest, I don't even think Sanders is that left-wing compared to what we are, right? But still, he's better than what they represent. Another thing that I wish will happen in the future and we thought we've got to do uh, strikes, protests and everything and not enforce a new election if possible um, closer than say 2021 when that will be the five year term. I honestly think Corbyn should do a much more radical manifesto than what his last one. His last one I was pleased with that and there was a lot of good things in there. I honestly think if he went much more radical, I honestly think that a lot of people would be, we really want this. We really want to see these bastards lose their money, uh, less war, less trident, less racism. And I think if, if we did that, I honestly think he would win. But at the same time, we can't just wait and do nothing and wait till that election, hoping he gets elected. We've got to be mobilising on the streets, um, starting next, well, starting from today, really. Um, don't just wait till next week when Trump comes. We should be doing it every day. Um, and I honestly do have high hopes for the future. And I do think that we will beat these bastards as we once did. Um, Cable Street proved that, um, that working class people can win battles. And I hope every one of you will join in and help win that struggle. Denis will be followed by Osama. Yeah, it's partly a question. It's just because I think, you know, there are these big ideas everywhere that. Trump is just a stupid, unstable, uncontrollable, uncontrollable guy. But, you know, it's going deeper than these. This idea that there would be, you know, from the point of view of capitalists, you know, uh, it would be interesting to have international markets and so on, no borders, and, and that racist policies and borders would just be a sort of demagogic uh, racy things for elections and, and so on. Uh, and so that's a, a question. Is there a, a sort of rationality from the point of view of capital at the moment about these nationalist, protectionist uh, and uh, racist policies? I mean, not just a sort of electoral politics, but I something deeper, which means that in some ways it would be more dangerous from, uh, for, for, for us. And if, you know, if uh, I raise this question, just remember during, before the uh, First World War, there were a debate inside the working class movement. You know, there were these Kautsky who was the leader of the, of the German uh, uh, working class movement that say that imperialism and war was completely irrational from the point of view of capitalists. Capitalists had the need of a world market and so on, and war was completely crazy. And Lenin arguing that there were a rationality of war uh, from 
the capitalist system was driving to war. And so that's my question, because I think that there's no complete uh, uh, contradictions or disconnection between the rise of the danger of fascism, uh, nationalist uh, uh, process, racism, borders, the attack against migrants, the war, you know, and just to finish, there were a book from uh, a French socialist during the 30s, which called Fascism and uh, Big Capital. I don't know if it's the uh, right translation in, in, in English, saying there are some contradictions. Of course, there are still some contradictions between capitalists and between different forms of capitals. But there are some dominant trends. And our politics, in some ways, is determined by the not dominant trends of, uh, of, of capitalism. And my question is, I think there's a dominant trend towards wars, toward nationalism, and these kind of things. And that's what makes the fight against racism inside our class so much important. So the final speaker of the session will be Osama. Um, hello. So I wanted to start with a very good example of uh, what happened in 2016, which is two uh, crucial elections. The first one is Trump versus Hillary, and the second one is Le Pen versus Macron. So as we all know, um, in one in America, in um, the United States. Trump got elected. Um, this has brought, you know, a big race on the right-wing activity, and uh, and we'll, you know, we'll we'll been able to fill it. But at the other hand, um, in France, um, Macron was the one who got elected. Um, this is. A very, you know, the typical um, clash that happens in a lot of uh, governments in the Western world, which is neoliberalism versus conservatism. Um, what I wanted to point out is that we we can see how um, Trump did, didn't just brought a lot of movement in the. Uh, right, right wing activity, but also out of movement and a lot of attraction to the left wing and to the uh, radical left wing. And there uh, are movements like Stand Up to Racism, because this wasn't just something that affected the United States, this is something that affected mostly the whole of the world. But uh, in France, we could say that mostly nothing changed. Right? It's just the neoliberals, you know, uh, not preaching um, direct racism and uh, giving the middle class, which, sorry for, uh, you know, stereotyping, but uh, I'm, I'm going to refer as the, you know, the liberals, which is often, you know, what happens. Um, this, uh, this is uh, what I want to get in, that um, the liberals, like, uh, are, from my point of view, uh, a collective of, you know, the population that often haven't had the opportunity to get into, you know, real politics. This could be for us several reasons. Maybe they were of, you know, uh, white middle class, they haven't really been, you know, um, object of racism or sex, you know, um, sexism or stuff like that. Um, so I, I'm going to cite um, a philosopher that I'm pretty sure a lot of people in this room hate him, and you know, no one really knows what does he lives in. And this is Slavoj Zizek. Um, when, I mean. Before the 2016 election, he was asked, who would you vote for? 
And this was his answer. Trump, I'm horrified, I'm horrified with him. I just think that Hillary is the real danger. Why? She built an impossible coalition. Remember when Bernie Sanders supported Hillary? This, from my point of view, is you know, a way of saying that um, we, we, we will not achieve anything by trying to, um, by re using reformism. The, we will not achieve anything by trying to elect um, uh, candidates like Hillary or Macron or even Bernie Sanders. I'm not going to you know, speak about Corbyn because I do actually believe he can change something, but he is a, a very uh, specific you know, candidate. No, he's something different. Sum up, please, comrade. So, um, so yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the fact that a lot of um, groups that, for example, Stand Up Tourism has had a big in, uh, impact in the last year and uh, a big race of the people who join, uh, this is affected by, you know, by uh, the race of, of the right wing as well. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's not something just, it's not something that isn't just bad. I think it's a big opportunity of, you know, it's something that we have to exploit and, uh, and use to, you know, attract people. Can you the, sum up, please, to comrade? The, to the left and show them what do we really want. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Alex, you want to sum up? Okay. Um, when I was speaking before, I couldn't remember who was responsible for stuffing the, the ballots in the 1960 presidential election. It was Mayor Daley of Chicago. He's supposed to have tilted the 1960 election in JFK's favour. Partly why I mention this is because, one of, I mean, just, just to focus on Trump, oppose, the, the person for a minute, moment of self-indulgence, uh, no one... I mean, the Kennedys had a relation to the mob, which liberals don't talk about. But no one talks about Trump's relation to the mob. Now, I find this bizarre, because Trump was um, in construction in New York. His father was in construction in New York. There's no way that someone could be in that business without having to deal with a mafia in his different forms. I, I mean, does the FBI have some kill a file on Trump. Is that what he's worried about when he denounces the FBI? Anyway, that's just my um, side comment on, on, on it. It's just something that makes me wonder. Or maybe they're just so, such severe death threats against anyone who knows saying anything that they keep quiet. Anyway, um, capitalism encompasses many things, including uh, not just corruption and crookery, but also inclu including nationalism and war. And Denis asked a very important question, which is the dominant trend towards nationalism and war. I mean, in a certain sense, I think it is. I th but I think you have to be careful at identifying the kind of level um, at which um, these, these phenomena to be, to be based. When uh, Kautsky argued... Um, um, before the First World War, that capitalism was becoming internationally integrated economically, and this would mean that war was becoming economically irrational. It was true that capitalism was becoming more integrated economically. Uh, Kautsky made two mistakes. One was, not as, as Lenin emphasized, not to see that capitalism is a constant process of uneven development. In other words, capitalism doesn't just expand as a system, but some bits grow more rapidly than others, and as that happens, power is shifted. Power, the time of the First World War, was shifting from Germany, uh, for, sorry, other way around, from Britain to Germany and the United States. That's the fundamental reason why the war happened. Today, power is shifting from the United States to, to China. This is a profoundly destabilizing factor. But secondly, Amid all the uncertainties and instability of capitalism, capitalists always 
uh, rely on their state, a specific state, to protect them uh, against their rivals and against, against the, the workers that they, they exploit. So we went through a period, another wave of internationalization of capitalism over the past few decades. That's what neoliberalism was about. It was the ideological decoration and the policy driver of a greater international integration of, 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 of capitalism. And that led to all sorts of euphoria about uh, a move to a genuinely cosmopolitan capitalism. In another meeting, someone quoted Tony Negri, who co-authored a famous book called Empire, which was all about how imperialism is over, we're now moving to transnational forms of power, and uh, Negri draws the logical conclusion of this. Faced with a right-wing government in Italy, he says, I hope the EU will intervene to save us you know, to impose a technocratic government will, that will save us from, from these, 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 these people. But what we saw during the crisis itself was the way in which, when confronted with a very, confronted with the potential collapse of the financial system, the different capitalist classes turned to their own nation state. In Europe, it wasn't the EU who saved the banks. The European Commission was kind of roughly shoved aside it was the German government saving the German banks. It was the British government saving the British banks. The French, the French, and so on and so forth. We see this again in the migration uh, non-crisis, because it isn't really a crisis in the sense of uh, the numbers involved or any, anything like that. It's a crisis that's constructed at the political level, but different national governments pursuing their own solutions. The Italians versus the Germans, versus the Austrians, versus the Hungarians, etc., etc. So there is this constant tendency to national disintegration uh, that we see at capitalism at the pres present time. There, there are two things that uh, prevent total disintegration. One is that the lines of capitalist organization, the flows of trade and investment, are still primarily inter inter international. Um, and that hasn't changed despite, despite the crisis. Now, you can say in the case of the US, it's easier to pursue an international, uh, sorry, a national solution than in most other major capitalisms because the share of exports in the US economy is far lower than it is, say, in Britain or Germany or, or wherever. So a more closed economy is more viable in the case of the United States. But nevertheless, a shutting of the US market to other major capitalists, capitalisms would have profoundly destabilizing consequences. The other thing that holds back a general trend to war is nuclear weapons and the way in which that holds states back. There was a moment when, look, when uh, <coughs> lots of, a few months ago, the media talked up the possibility of a military confrontation between Russia and the US in Syria. And I never believed that that would happen for a moment. First of all, because Syria just isn't, too, isn't important enough to have a thermonuclear war about. But secondly, because thermonuclear war, yeah, just isn't in the interest of any capitalist class. The danger isn't so much that they would seek a general war to solve their problems, but that they might stumble into one as a result of their increasing lack of control of what, what's happening. And smaller wars, they're certainly happy, happy to engage in. Denis, who spoke, comes from France. There's a good book on French militarism. I've forgotten the name of the author for, for the minute. Uh, uh, a very interesting French Marxist on French militarism, where he argues one way in which the French state has tried to maintain some sort of advantage against Germany when Germany is, so, is comparatively so su successful economically is by building up its apparatus of military intervention and becoming increasingly active on the southern side of the, uh, the, uh, the Mediterranean and in the northern parts of Africa and so, so on and so forth. So small wars are something that they'll happily engage in to advance their interests. The problem is when a small war might m morph into something bigger and worse. So that's my, uh, that's my answer to Denis' question. But what I'd just like to conclude by say, saying is that, that, that 
I, I don't think the level of the problem that we're facing is primarily that of the threat of war or something like that. There are wars going on, there'll be more wars, this is part of capitalism, nationalism is how capitalist classes try to prop themselves up ideologically and so on. That, you know, that's just part of the cap capitalist scene. What we face is something more immediate. The danger of a sharp shift to the right in the politics of the Western ruling classes involving not just more racist policies directed at migrants, but a continuation of the kind of neoliberal attacks that have been mounted on living standards on, on the welfare state, because the weak, greater racism means a weaker working class. I don't believe the right-wing nationalists have, the, with the possible exception of Trump, are strong enough to stand up in general to a capitalist class that wants continued neoliberal policies. So what we're most likely to get is more racism and more neoliberalism. This is a profound threat to all of us. We need to start mobilizing against that. You know, and now is the moment when it really needs to start. The 9th of June, 15,000 far-right people, lots of them young, lots of them open fascists, marching in the center of London. Let me tell you, that has never happened. I'm old enough to have lived through the period of the, the NF. The most they had were a few thousand of people marching to the Cenotaph, one remem Remembrance Day. Mosley, I don't, I tried to find out, I don't think Mosley ever was able to organize uh, a, a march as big as, big as 15,000. This is the biggest uh, street turnout of the far right ever in this country. If that's not a wake up call, I don't know what is. So we need to work as hard as possible, not simply to s tell Trump, Trump to hurry up and to go to the particular room in hell that is waiting for him. We have to be out next Saturday, the Saturday after tomorrow, the 14th of July, to stop the, the far right in London. This is the call. This is the challenge that we now face. Everything else fades by comparison with that. Of course, out of successful movements and struggles, we can build a stronger left with a, a more credible alternative to the, to the system. But if we don't stop these bastards now, begin to turn the tide against them, then we will be in really deep trouble.